Pastor Ed asked me to speak a couple weeks ago, and of course, I welcome the opportunity. Uh, this past week was, was a little crazy for me, though, between wedding stuff and a bunch of other things that are going on. It just seemed a little crazy. But yesterday, I told my mom and my dad, I said, man, this week has been nuts. It's just been out of control. It really has been. And, uh, you know, I've been asking God, you know, wh- what's this all about? Why is this, why is this happening? And God spoke through my mom yesterday when, when she said to me, Ernie, that means God has something for somebody tomorrow. And, uh, and I said, you know what, you're right. You're right, maybe that's, that's God prepping me. Um, or rather, maybe that's the enemy trying to stop me from, from uh, this word this morning. Well, I'll tell you how the, my, my morning ended off before I got here. Uh, using, uh, I've been using Axe lately, you know, that thing that high school boys use to cover up their awful odors? Um, well, I was using Axe this morning, and I was praying with my mouth open. Anybody know what happened next? I sprayed the Axe and misdirected it towards my mouth, and I swallowed a, a, a spray full of Axe. That stuff is disgusting. I don't recommend trying it. It is gross. It is nasty. It kind of smells or tastes like it smells, you know, strong. I, I want you guys to do me a favor. We're going to go back for just a moment. I want you to imagine we're in the Old West. We're going to talk about the 1870s. Um, you have these weary cowboys who are uh, in their dusty Levi's, their jeans, and they're gathered around a blazing campfire after a long day on the open range. You hear the lonely howl of a coyote off in the distance as it counterpoints the notes of a, of a guitar and as the moon floats serenely overhead. Suddenly you hear this bellow of pain as it shatters the night and a cowboy leaps away from the fire dancing in agony. Hot rivet syndrome has claimed another victim. In those days, Levi's were made as they had been from the first days of Levi Strauss with these little copper rivets at different stress points made to provide extra strength. On these original Levi's, the Model 501s, there was something called a crotch rivet, and it was a critical one. (laughs) When cowboys crouched too long by the fire, the rivet just grew uncomfortably hot. For years, these brave men of the the West suffered with this uh, occupational hazard. (laughs) Then in 1933, Walter Haas Sr., the president of Levi Strauss, went camping himself in his Levi 501s. He too was crouched by a crackling fire in the high Sierras, drinking in the pure mountain air, when all of a sudden, he fell prey to hot rivet syndrome. So he consulted with his uh, professional wranglers in his party and and asked them if they'd suffered the the same mishap. They all passionately responded, yes. Haas vowed that the offending rivet must go. And at their next meeting at the board of directors voted into extinction. You see, there are two things that generally force people to change. They either see the light or they feel the heat. You see, we're either motivated by the vision of a better future or the pain of the present. Today we're going to talk about change. I think change is something we all experience pretty often. Whether you consider once a year often or every other day often. You see, if we're not changing, then either you're in a rut or you may want to check your pulse. Scripture talks about change time and time again. As a matter of fact, Psalm chapter 24, verses 1 and 2 tells us that the Lord, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and the world and those who dwell therein. It tells us that he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Kind of shaky ground, right? You see, seas and rivers are these bodies of waters that, are, that, that are, are always moving, always changing. They're constantly in flux, constantly changing. When there's a storm, they're constantly tossed back and forth. I think that's a lot like our lives. We often encounter those changes. Like I said, for some we see them daily, for others they're more separated. But there's one thing that's for certain. The only thing constant, the only thing constant is change. 
This morning, the title of my message, as you saw in your bulletin, is Anchored in the Bedrock. See, the bedrock is basically the core. It's the, it's the bottom of the bottom. You drop an anchor, and it hits the sand, and it's not going to hold. It might drag across the bottom. But if you drop an anchor into the bedrock, that boat's not going to move. Hebrews 6.19. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19, it says this. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I'm going to read that again. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, and it's a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You see, anchors, anchors, they keep boats or ships from drifting. They keep them from crashing into the rocks, and they, they give us stability when there's a storm. Can you guys repeat something after me? We have a hope in Christ. We have a hope in Christ. You see, David Jeremiah uh, once wrote this, this, this observation. He said, a cartoonist in the New Yorker drew a picture of a small town general store with this sign in the window saying, going out of business, slowly but surely. Many churches and organizations go out of business slowly but surely because they resist change. You know, you might not like change, but I bet you I can think of something worse, and that's stagnation, staying still. Stagnation can befall any organization, but it can also hurt us. You see, we have to remember that while not all changes are good, good changes or changes from God are always good. As a matter of fact, they're very good. You see, wherever the, Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom, wrote the Apostle Paul, and he says in 2 Corinthians 3.18 that as all of us reflect the Lord's glory with faces that are not covered with veils, we're being changed into his image with ever-increasing glory. We're being changed into his image with ever-increasing glory. This comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. I believe there's three uh, stages people go through when they're confronted uh, with the change. The first stage we go through when we're confronted with the change is resistance to the change. I mean, think about it. You know people who've gone through a heart bypass surgery, or any surgery for that matter. A lot of times, medical professional will tell them, listen, you're going to go through the surgery, but you have to change your lifestyle. You have to change your lifestyle, otherwise this isn't going to work. Do you know that about 90% of people who go through heart bypass surgery in particular don't change their lifestyle after being consulted. You see, it seems that most people would rather die than change. We don't want to change. We push it off as much as humanly possible. But when it's a God change, we can't really push it off. I mean, we can certainly try, but who can resist God? So if this first stage is tolerant or resistance to change, the second stage is is, uh, is tolerance of the change, where we kind of unwillingly accept the change that's coming to us. I'll tolerate it, but I'm not going to accept it. And the last stage is embracing the change, where we finally say, you know what? This is a good thing. This is a God thing. We're going to talk about a little portion of Scripture um, in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 6, where the people of God uh, encountered a, a pretty big change, a pretty enormous change for that matter. You see, King Uzziah, King Uzziah was somebody that was uh, held in high importance. He was, he was a king that they loved, the people of God loved. And it says in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, that in the year King Uzziah died, Isaiah says this, and you could tell there's, there's something behind that. There's something more than just this guy died. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, and he was high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. In the year King Uzziah died, 
And that's somebody they loved. That's somebody they revered. They, they cared about that king. He took care of them. He helped them establish this, this strong army. And now he's gone. Wow. What a change. It wasn't sudden. He was sick for a while, but man, what a change nonetheless. A lot of times we see changes coming and we don't prepare for them the way we should. You see, as Uzziah was this capable king. He was energetic. He was somebody people loved. He was well organized. He was blessed. The Bible tells us that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And he was determined to seek God. You, you see, my understanding is that the people knew who was coming next, who was next in line for the throne, and that was Uzziah's son. Uzziah was this great king. He was a good guy. People loved him. But then his son, he was just an average guy. He was a mediocre king. His name was Jotham. He was somewhat prosperous, but he didn't quite do what Uzziah did. The Bible doesn't talk about him doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord. As a matter of fact, he failed to remove places of worship to Baal. He was a decent organizer, nothing special about him. You see, the people of God went from having this person who they loved, who they looked up to, who they said, that's, that's my king, to this guy who, who was mediocre at best. Transition of kingship was a huge change. It was a scary one for the people. That's why Isaiah says, in the year Uzziah died, it's a scary time. So what's the deal with change? Why has change happened? Why is it so important? What, What's the deal with change? I'll tell you what, I think we can all admit that change is really, really difficult. I said it before, but in the year King Uzziah died, you could almost sense a, a feeling of mourning, a feeling of sorrow. And it's beyond the loss of a person. It's the loss of like a, like a pillar. It was the loss of something good, of something stable, something you knew could protect you. You see, I think we like having that sense of stability. Wouldn't you agree? We like knowing what, what the next thing is going to be. We don't like to be caught by surprise. Who does? We enjoy having these, these steady and unshaken routines. Oh, but when change comes, we'll do anything possible to avoid it. You see, I believe people avoid change until the, the pain of remaining the same is, is greater than the pain of changing. When change comes, it leads us to this place of, of uncertainty and doubt. Side note here, just so you know, doubt isn't the opposite of faith, but it's, it's an element of faith. When change comes, we... We want to know why, but we can't seem to find the answers. Things were going so good, God, but why? Why is this happening to me now? I don't get it. We figure, you know what? It must be something I've done. You see, taking a new step or saying a new thing, uttering a new word is the thing we all fear the most. I want to tell you a little story um, that happened to, to us, my family, my immediate family about a year and a half ago, I'd say. Um, I was sitting at work, and I, I called mom like I usually do. I call my mom every day. Yes, I'm a mama's boy. Um, <laughs> she's laughing because she knows it's true. Um, so I, I called my mom, and I said, hey, mom, how's it going? You could sense a different tone of voice, and she was like, um, dad just lost his job. And wow, talk about a change and talk about a sudden change. That was a scary thing. All sorts of questions come into our, our minds. How are we going to survive with, without dad working? And how's this going to work? The biggest question, God, where are you? You know, God is faithful. God is faithful because dad was, after several months um, of job searching, he was able to find a job. Do you know what change does for us? It causes us to relinquish control. It removes us from ourselves being the center of our own universe to, to God being the center. It forces us to release the grip and um, 
What's that girl's name, Carrie Underwood, who said, Jesus, take the wheel? That's what that does. That's what change does. It causes us to relinquish control. It forces us to release the grip and kind of let Jesus take the wheel. See, because it's no longer us relying on our own efforts. It's us relying on God. When change comes, it, it rattles our worlds. It doesn't surprise God, but it rattles our world. It, it, it shakes our faith. Because a lot of times, progress, progress towards, towards where we were going, the things we wanted, our desires, is thwarted. You go in this direction and psh. You see, I think oftentimes we try to make a beeline towards the things we want. Do you know what a beeline is? Yeah, that's what we think a beeline is. Have you ever seen a bee fly? Bees don't fly straight. They're going crazy and moving around and... Side note, I got stung by a bee once, right in my forehead. Yeah, that hurt. Has nothing to do with my message, but that happened. True story. True story. True story. I sprayed myself in the mouth with axe. I got stung by a bee in the forehead. Yeah. So what happens often, our progress towards the things we want is thwarted. It's an actual beeline. You see, then we lose sight of God's faithfulness. We forget about how faithful our God is. One of the things I've held on to since become a, becoming a Christian, and I don't know if it's that I heard somebody say this, but now I say that I said it. Um, I say that our God is faithful. Our God is so faithful. He's faithful even when we're not. You see, what we end up doing is we focus on the problem that, that's incurred with this change, the, the problem that comes with the change. Sometimes it's a sudden change, sometimes it's a change that, that happens over time, but we, we focus on this, this mountain of a problem. And we forget that those changes, those things that are coming our way are too big for us to handle on our own, at least without God's help. I want to give you a couple of things to remember when we see these big changes come, when, when King Uzziah dies. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah says that he saw the Lord. He says, I saw the Lord. So the first thing I want you to remember is this. When changes come, when, when those difficulties come with those changes, keep your focus on God. Simple enough. So in the midst of a significant change, in the midst of this, this huge mountain of a problem where Uzziah died, where their pillar died, where the, the leader of their army, the one that, that put things together for them died, in the year that he died, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. In spite of that huge challenge, he saw the Lord. In spite of the big things that might be going on in our lives, whether it's financial challenges, whether there are changes in our, in our jobs, or whatever the case may be in a relationship, he saw the Lord. In the midst of a significant change, Isaiah was able to see God. Keep your focus on God. Understand that a faith that's not tested, cannot be trusted. You see, the, the, the stage was set when Uzziah died for the testing of these people's faith. This younger, less experienced king, somebody who didn't know as much, who they didn't, they didn't trust the way they trusted Uzziah. The stage was set for the testing of their, their faith with this change in kingship. So understand that a faith that's not tested can't be trusted. And then understand that God is bigger than the challenges that come with these changes. Isaiah said that he saw the Lord and he was high and lifted up. You see, God is bigger, or God was bigger than the challenge of the change in, in kingship. Yeah, it was a big challenge, but God was bigger. God was high and lifted up. Even in that year that King Uzziah died, even in the year that, that we might be going through some, some difficulty, some storms, the Lord is still high and lifted up. Amen? We have a hope in Christ. You see, I want to give you a quick equation. Just a little side note, I guess you could call it. When changes come, our, our ability to adapt, plus our obedience to God, equals our own spiritual growth. You see, when we change, we grow. If we don't change, we don't grow. And if we don't grow, 
then we're not really living. I like to call change or changes rut prevention. John Maxwell, I think, said it really well. He said, when change is successful, we look back and call it growth. When change is successful, we look back and call it growth. Our hope is in God. How many of you would agree to that this morning? Our hope is in God. Hebrews 6.19 tells us that he's sure and he's steadfast. He's sure. He's sure. What does that mean? It means that we can rest in the assurance of God's provision and his safety. In times of change and uncertainty, the only thing that is certain is God's faithfulness. He's steadfast. Our God is unchanging. He's immovable. The hope we have in Christ serves as this, kind of like this life preserver when difficult changes and challenges come our way. I read this the other day in a commentary, and I'm going to read it to you guys. Listen to this. It says, the soul is the ship. The world is the sea. The bliss beyond the world, the distant coast. The hope resting on faith the anchor which prevents the vessel from being tossed to and from, the encouraging consolation in the pro- through the promise and the oath of God, which is the cable connecting the ship to the anchor. We're going to look at a portion of scripture in Acts chapter 27. You guys can turn there. I don't think it's up on the screen. So. Um, Acts chapter 27. We're going to go from verse 13 and kind of, kind of go through it. Acts chapter 27, verse 13. We'll go, through, uh, we'll go through verse 23. It says, When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, so they weighed the anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. It says, Before long, a wind of a hurricane force called the Nor'easter swept down from the island. It says that the ship was caught by the storm and could not heed into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Cauda, we were hardly able to make lifeboat, the lifeboat secure, so the men hoisted it aboard. All right, we'll stop there. In verse 13, the writer says, when a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw the, the opportunity. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. When a gentle south wind began to blow... And then the last sentence in verse 13 says, before very long, or a, hur- a wind of a hurricane force swept down. It's pretty interesting how it started off slow and then psh, started coming down. You guys ever, ever seen a hurricane or witnessed a hurricane? It's pretty crazy, right? The funny thing is it always starts with a, with a, a drizzle. Or you, you can sense the hurricane coming, right? And then psh, You see, I think God often eases us and urges us gently before the changes come. So be mindful of the changes. It says, when a gentle south wind began to blow. When a gentle south wind began to to blow. And then before very long, a hurricane. So be mindful of the changes. He eases us gently and urges us. Prepare to fully rely on God. How many of you guys get prepared when you when you see or hear of a storm coming. There's a snowstorm. Don't go to ShopRite before the snowstorm. <laughs> Bad idea. Bad idea. I don't go to ShopRite as it is, but, but if I did, I wouldn't go before a snowstorm. Yep. Bad. Prepare to fully rely on God. You see, I don't believe we can beat challenges like this on our own. It says in verse 23, Paul talks to the men on the ship, and he says, Now I urge you to keep your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. You see, I think God's purpose, uh, purposes in allow us, allowing us to go through some of these changes, or some of the challenges we encounter when we're about to go through a change, it's not to, to destroy us. I don't think those, those things are to de- destroy us. I believe a lot of times it's, it's for course correction. We want one thing, God wants us to do another thing. Or to remind us that our stability, the thing that we rely on, maybe having a job or having that relationship, that thing that we count on for stability, it'll always be there. 
Our stability is not found in those things. Our stability is found in Christ, who's the anchor of our soul. It says in verse 27 that on the 14th, 14th, 14th night, 14th, that's a lot. That's two weeks. Two weeks of a storm coming and being battered by the waves. That's a long time. A long time. How many of you agree that's a long time? Yeah, long time. All right. So on the 14th night, they were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea. You see, sometimes periods of change, those times where we, those seasons where we go through change, last for extended periods of time. Our job is to do our best to endure those challenges that come. Not by our own strength, but fully relying on God's help. And then in verse 29, it says that the men, the men on the ship threw down four anchors so that they wouldn't be thrown up against the rocks. It says, fearing that they would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and they began to pray for daylight. There's four anchors, four anchors that they dropped into the bedrock so that they wouldn't be shifted to and from. What four anchors this morning can we, on a personal note, drop into the bedrock? I believe this morning we can count on the anchor of God's faithfulness. A little closing to that story about my dad, and you can ask him this afterwards. Not everybody at once, because he'll get nervous. Um, but but on, the, on the way home that day, um, you ever see people singing on the train? And it's kind of like, whoa, that guy's singing over there. Well, on the way home that day, I don't know if it was like that, Dad, so forgive me if it, it's not. But, um, but on the way home that day, my dad said that the only thing that could come to mind that he could think of uh, was that song, um, 10,000 Reasons. 10,000 Reasons. Why is that? Because we can count on the anchor of God's faithfulness. What does it say in Deuteronomy 31.8? He'll never leave us. He won't forsake us. I like the way the message version puts it. It says, he's right there with you. He won't let you down. He won't leave you. Don't be intimidated and don't worry. The Ernie version says, he's got your back. He's got your back. You see, when a soul is in affliction, temptation, or desertion, his cry is, the Lord has forsaken me and God has forgotten me. Sometimes this feeling approaches actual despair. One of my favorite scriptures is Psalm, Psalm chapter 13, where David is in extreme pain and he's, in this, this, he's crying out to God saying, God, where are you? And then he realizes, he says, and I'll trust in your unfailing love. I know you'll take care of me. So sometimes those feelings approach actual despair. But here's an anchor for our souls to hold on to. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The second anchor we can count on is the anchor of God's grace. I love what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. It says, each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in your weakness. And then Paul says, so I'm glad now to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. The grace of God helps us do things we normally can't. He helps us find strength in those times where we're weak. The third anchor we can count on is that anchor of hope that we spoke about in the beginning. Hope is an anchor of the soul. The soul is the part of us which is most vulnerable to to being tossed about the changing waves and, and, and the changing circumstances. See, like a boat floating in the water, we live in unstable, in this unstable element of the world, and we're constantly moving and constantly changing in a state of flux and, and passing away, but our hope in Christ is an anchor that passes through time, beyond time, and into eternity. It says, within the veil. Only when we are anchored in the eternal can we find stability in the storms of life. If our security is in circumstances of, or anything else in this life, we'll just be tossed helplessly about the waves in the storms of life. The last anchor that I wrote down here, and there's many more characteristics of God that we can count on. These are just a couple. And this one, uh, this one when, I, when I asked my parents, what, what did they count on? Uh, I believe it was my, my dad who said, uh, I counted on God being in control. So we can count on the anchor of God's sovereignty. It says this, in the frigid waters around the Greenland are countless icebergs, some little, some gigantic. 
If you'd observe them carefully, you'd notice that sometimes the small ice flows in one direction while the massive, the massive counterparts float in another direction. The explanation is simple. It says surface winds drive the little ones, whereas huge masses of ice are carried along by deep ocean currents. When we face trials and tra tragedies or changes or challenges, it's helpful to see our lives as being subject to two forces. Two forces, surf and, surface winds and ocean currents. The winds representing everything, uh, everything uh, changeable, unpredictable, and distressing. But operating simultaneously with these gusts and gales is another force that's even more powerful. It's the sure movement of God's so sovereign and wise purposes, the deep flow of his unchanging love. You see, I believe that either God is totally sovereign, ordaining, ruling, disposing of all things as he will, or he has no control over anything, and faith in him is absolute absurdity. With this, we'll close. But think about this for a second. Think about the people of God in Israel. And, and it must have been tough for these Israelites who were roaming and, and wandering for 40 years in the wilderness. They'd pitch their tents, they'd get up, they'd get settled, and then a cloud or a pillar of fire would, would basically say, hey, it's time to move, time to change where you're at. See, my encouragement to us this morning is to move with the cloud. It's to learn to respond to change positively, even when things are a little difficult. You see, God never stays still. He's always working. And we've got to learn to move with him and work with him. Can we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this day. We thank you, God, for the opportunity that you give us to come and worship you together and spend time together, Lord, and talk about your word. Father, changes are difficult, God, and we ask, Lord, that you would help us, that you would see us through those difficulties. Lord, we know that you're sovereign, Lord, and that you give us hope. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for those anchors, your characteristics, your goodness, your grace, your love towards us. In the name of Christ we pray, amen.